All right. Well, here we are. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to See Yourself Running, the realities of running as an LGBTQIA plus candidate. My name is Quentin Savoie, and I'm the political director at Run for Something. We are here tonight with our partners and friends at the LGBTQ Victory Fund. One of the most rewarding aspects of Run for Something is to recruit and support amazing diverse candidates from all over the country that run strong grassroots elections. I know that there are many current and future candidates on this call, so it is my pleasure to be your co-host tonight for this evening's event. A couple of housekeeping things before we get started. Please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat box. Make sure you're using the setting that is set to everyone. We've been mastering this Zoom thing now for two years. Let's, we're gonna get it right, we can do it, we can do it. Feel free to use the chat box to comment on the program or interact with one another. This is a great chance to get to know other people and help build our community. After initial discussions with our panelists, we'll open up the floor to questions. So put any questions that you have for the panel in the Q&A box. We will pull questions from there, not from the chat box. For this particular webinar, we are using Zoom Live transcription services. If you would like to view live captions on your screen, please click the more menu in the lower right hand corner and select show subtitles. Later on in the call, we will launch a poll. So if you'd like to take, <clears throat> excuse me, so if you'd like to take the next step in working with Run for Something, you'll be able to opt in based on that poll. That is all of the housekeeping that I have for you and we'll get right into the program. I'm gonna turn it over now to our friend, Sean Malloy. Sean? Hi, thanks so much, Quentin. Uh, so happy to be here. I'm Sean Malloy, Vice President of Political Programs at LGBTQ Victory Fund, the only national organization dedicated to electing out LGBTQ people who believe in the fundamental right of privacy and bodily autonomy uh, in the United States of America. Um, uh, so excited to be here today uh, during Pride Month to talk to some of our amazing elected officials. Um, you know, Victory Fund is a partner with the LGBTQ Victory Institute, which is our C3. They work with groups like Run For Something to help recruit and train LGBTQ people to step up to run for office. So Victory has been a wonderful um, ally with Run For Something because we are both doing the work to get underrepresented people into office to help make the change we all know needs to happen, whether that is action on the climate, healthcare, um, name your issue, um, or to actually fight for equality under the law, um, which is still um, a, a big, big problem um, and, and getting worse, sadly, it would seem. But <clears throat> I'd encourage you all to uh, step up and run. And I'm excited to talk to our panelists who are going to talk about their journey to doing exactly that. All of them are history makers in some way or another when it comes to uh, getting elected. And all of them went and, and made sure that they were prepared uh, to run the campaign that was going to be successful. And that's a huge aspect of stepping up to run. Um, I'm also happy to say that all of these elected officials are on our Out for America map, um, which is a map of all the elected officials, out LGBTQ elected officials in the United States. I'm happy to say that after last year's elections, we broke the 1,000 elected official mark for the first time ever in US history. Now we need to keep it there. And in order to achieve equitable representation in government, we need to elect over 35,000 more LGBTQ people. Uh, and so we've got a long way to go. Um, and we're here to learn from some of our amazing uh, elected officials who have already gotten elected. Well, you need to also make sure that they stay there. But tonight we're gonna to hear about their path to running and running. And so I'd love to introduce first, um, uh, Azreen Awal from the Duluth City Council in Minnesota. Um, Azreen uh, was elected just last year um, as a student, um, you know, something that we do not see enough of in my opinion. And so Azreen, please uh, go ahead and uh, tell us um, a little bit about yourself. Hey everyone, assalamualaikum. Um, can you hear me? I'm having some internet connection problems. If you can't, I'm gonna try to just pause, fix the issues and then I can jump back on. Can folks hear me? We can hear you, yeah, just a little uh, choppy, but we hear you. 
Okay, hopefully. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Sasrina Ishii, they pronouns, I'm from Duluth, Minnesota. Um, last year I um, had the honor of, you know, collaborating with my community, coming together and running a campaign, um, very much so based on um, just issues that concern a lot of Duluthians of affordable housing, environmental um, protection, um, energy, climate change, um, and equity. I'm not complete my degree yet, but I'm very, very close um, to finishing up and getting that degree. So that's a little class from, um, from that. Um, yeah, and I'm excited to, um, uh, to be here and be present. And one of the things that um, I never anticipated running for local politics, and it wasn't until my my mentors and my um, peers approached me, asking me to run, to raise my voice on the city council, and bring the diverse voices that I represent and my identities to that space. Um, and I never, I never saw myself. Um, Uh, Azreen, I think we're having trouble hearing you. I know you said you might want to try to restart your internet. Um, we can go ahead and move on with the introductions and um, if you want to try that out. Um, next, I'd love to introduce someone who's also a history maker. Uh, Jonathan Melton, um, I remember meeting, I think it was in 2018, uh, was elected to uh, the Raleigh City Council in 2019, uh, one of the first LGBTQ people to serve on that council, um, and is elected citywide. Uh, Jonathan, welcome. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Jonathan Melton. Um, I'm an at-large council member in Raleigh, as Sean said. My first time ever running for office was in 2019, and I was very proud to have the support of the LGBTQ Victory Fund and run for something. Um, they were invaluable resources. I'm also not someone who ever saw myself running for office. I had done a lot of nonprofit and community organizing work prior to running. I helped co-found an organization called Stonewall Sports, which is an LGBTQ I an allied uh, philanthropic sports league, and I was just becoming very personally affected by some of the issues in Raleigh, like housing affordability and lack of safe and reliable transit and felt compelled to run. I've always been the type of person who says, if not me, then who? You don't wait for someone else to step up. So I raised my hand and I worked as hard as I could, and I was elected in 2019, and I will be on the ballot for re-election this fall. Thank you so much, Jonathan. You know, I met my partner playing uh, Stonewall Dodgeball. And so um, your effect goes well beyond uh, just the philanthropy that those teams do. Um, next, I'm so excited to welcome uh, Mari Turner, who is a historic figure in many regards, the first out non-binary legislator in the entire United States of America and first Muslim ever elected to the state of Oklahoma, in the state of Oklahoma. Uh, Marie, welcome. Well, thank you, thank you. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Um, yes, Marie Turner, they did pronouns, the first Muslim elected uh, to the Oklahoma State Legislature, first non-binary person elected, apparently in US history, um, uh, which was something I didn't find out until <laughs> after the election happened. So. Um, uh, but yes, um, uh, born and raised community organizer, worked uh, with the NAACP, uh, then the Council on American Islamic Relations, and in the ACLU, Civil Rights and Liberties are my passion, and in, in running uh, and working there, I started to find out more um, about the hurdles that uh, directly impacted folks had in order to be able to become our own representation, um, and 
so decided to run for office and I thought we might end up here in 2023, not 2020, but uh, we did it. So, yeah. Well, thank you and welcome again to all of our panelists. I've got a couple of questions for you. Um, as Reen, I think we have you back. Um, if so, we're gonna find out. Uh, can you tell us about the moment you saw yourself uh, you know, running, the first time you, you felt that? And, and why did you run? Thanks for me fine now. Can hear me? We we are um we can hear you a little bit, um, but I apologize. I missed a panelist. Um, first rule of moderating: don't miss a panelist. And this is a absolutely fantastic legislator, a history making legislator, the first out trans legislator elected in the state of Colorado. Has been a fantastic leader, not just in that legislature, rising to leadership positions but across the country. Um, I think almost every single trans candidate who stepped up to run for state legislature has talked to Brianna Tone, and we are so excited to have her today. I apologize, Brianna. Welcome. No worries, John. Uh, thanks for having me here. Uh, I'm Brianna Tatone, my pronouns are she, her, and I represent House District 27, Colorado, and I apologize, I'm in a weird spot here. I'm double dutying. Uh, I'm supposed to speak at the Cobalt Reproductive uh, Rights uh, Gala here in a second. Uh, so I will have to step out for five minutes in a minute. Uh, but um, for me, you know, like a lot of other people, I did not expect to ever see myself in a position like this. Um, I was someone who worked in the community. Uh, I started out as a volunteer firefighter when I was 16. And uh, I had this crazy idea at some point that I wanted to do something to leave a lasting impression on, on the world in some way. And I thought maybe I would do that through academia and um, never quite got there. Um, after when I came out in 2016, that was a turning point for me where I realized that I had uh, another opportunity to fight for a community that I belong to. And through that, uh, I became an advocate and someone asked me to run for office and it was in the, a, a seat that was heavily Republican. It was, went to the Republican by 14% in the previous election. And nobody expected me to win. Not the Democrats or the Republicans thought I was going to win. So we put in the work, uh, we knocked on the doors, we used my uh, skills and my qualifications to um, make sure that people knew that they had another option that somebody really was caring about the community and wanted to do the work. And uh, we won by a, a very, very small margin of 439 votes out of 50,000. And uh, that was my first election. And since then I won re-election in 2020 and I'm looking to run again uh, for a third term now, but um, it's important for us to have these conversations to make sure that people know they can ask people like us who have done it, how to do, how to win, win in a tough district. Uh, these are all things that I take a lot of time uh, out of my schedule to make sure we widen the bench. So if you're ever thinking about it, you know, I, I will be a resource for you and uh, please reach out and I'm happy to help. Thank you. And thank you for all you do. Um, <clears throat> okay. All right. Azreen, uh, do you want to try your answer again? Why did you step up to run? Hey, um, I'm gonna be, <laughs> my video's on one screen, but my can't, my voice is gonna come through a different, I hope it works out for folks. Sorry about the tech issues. Like I said, this is why we need municipal broadband. Um, hey everyone, my name is Azreen. I she, they pronouns from Duluth, Minnesota. Um, really excited to be here. I'm glad my phone is coming in clutch right now. Um, thank you, Scott, from the, uh, uh, so one of the reasons, uh, like I was saying, um, I never anticipated running for uh, 
office, political office ever in my life. It was not something that I ever had dreamed of or imagined besides when I was younger. I think when I immigrated first to the United States when I was three years old from Bangladesh with my family, um, I remember someone telling me, it's like, oh, now you're a naturalized citizen. The only thing you can't do is run for president. And I was like, well, that's kind of messed up. I came here when I was three years old. I grew up here all my life. But anyway, that was probably my only intrigue in like thinking that immigrants should be able to run for president. Um, but fast forward, I've been involved in issue-based campaigns, um, really promoting equity and diversity, um, addressing Islamophobia, fighting against homophobia, um, uh, queerphobia, um, and xenophobia too. And in, in, during my time in um, as a student, more of a non-traditional student, um, and as an com active community member. So during as I was kind of involved and active in the community, I guess people saw my passion, saw my passion for change and equity. And last year around this time, actually in around April, around April, I was approached by multiple community members um, and elected officials um, who saw my passion and saw my um, kind of the value and vision that I had for the type of community I wanted my descendants um, to kind of grow up in, how to be a, be a good descendants that, or the people that come after us. And they asked me to run. And when I heard that, I was at first like, no way, I will not be running. But then multiple people came and kept asking. And I kept trying to figure out if this was a place where I could use my skills, use my voice, and advocate for people. Because at the end of the day, I didn't want it to be about me. I want it to be about my community. Is something that this something that the community can get behind? Um, and at the same time, you know, microaggressions come left and right. So I was also like questioning, is Minnesota ready for, for someone who looks like me? Is Duluth ready for someone who looks like me, someone who has life experiences like me? Um, and that combined with a lot of imposter syndrome, which I know is a tactic of white supremacy, but a lot of imposter syndrome is like, am I ready for this? Should I be doing this? Should I, should I be running? Um, and with with all of that, all of those, like the turmoil that I was feeling, I kind of came to an answer. Yes, if I raise my voice, um, I think I can advocate for people at the council. Um, I think I can bring diversity and a different perspective. I can fight for justice and equity and, um, you know, uh, continue my work to eliminate discrimination and racism. Um, so in that moment, I said, yes, I will run. I will. Um, you know, and we ran, I brought a lot of diverse voices to my council, my campaign team, and we ended up running a really strong can, uh, campaign. And I got elected in November, um, all due to my community and the folks who, you know, stood behind those, you know, values of equity and diversity and inclusion. Um, and today I, I'm five, six months in, into the council and it's still like drinking water from a fire hydrant, but it gets better and your community is always there to support you. Amazing, <clears throat> amazing. Um, uh, you know, Representative Turner, uh, tell us about the moment, you know, uh, when, when it came across your mind, I'm going to run, and, and why did you do that? I always I get ready to start talking and forget to take it off mute. I um, honestly write the, my sentiments really echo Azreen's, right? Um, I was a community organizer and organizing in House District 88. <clears throat> Long before I ever thought about running, I truly didn't actually decide I was going to run until probably about, I don't know, maybe two or three months, or maybe about four months before I actually um, uh, announced and everything. And so uh, I was organizing and in my time at the ACLU in all of the community and uh, direct policy, community bridge building and direct policy advocacy that we were doing, I, my time at the legislature really kind of solidified that the folks making decisions uh, about our everyday lives would never have to live on the other side of those decisions. So I did what the deep introvert in me wanted to do. And I looked for anybody else to run for office. I looked for community organizers that I had been working with um, directly, uh, folks who were had been just, who were justice involved, 
um, to talk to them about that. And that's when I realized that there were so many other hurdles to being able to run for office. And that's also when folks started asking me. Um, I think the stat is that like a man has to be asked one time to run for office, if that, and it's like, yeah, I'm in, right? A woman has to be asked about seven times. And uh, I think for folks who live beyond the binary, um, uh, that number goes up extensively. I probably had roughly 20, 25 conversations before I started to take myself as seriously as, as my community did. And um, uh, I truly, truly uh, will echo probably every sentiment that a stream has because um, I, it is one of the most humbling experiences. Me as a Capricorn, I'm very particular about how people perceive me. Um, uh, and so uh, to have someone say like, we've seen the work that you have been doing with us for years, right? And we want you to be our representation is very, very empowering. So I don't know, it was like all of those conversations, right? I don't know if I could pinpoint one specific uh, moment, but I, I think like a combination of the years leading up to the word, uh, to running for office and every single conversation that I had along the way. So. Excellent, amazing. And yes, you know, um, the those scales of being asked to run, right? They magnify. Um, uh, as we get to more and more underrepresented uh, groups in, in, in government. Um, and that's why we need you all to step up and run. Uh, Jonathan, could you tell us a bit more about the moment you decided to step up to run and why? I think for me, it was a little bit of a slow build. Um, I tell this story in a way, and I don't mean to be rude, um, that for a long time, Raleigh was run by a lot of old white retirees. And I have nothing against old white retirees. I hope to be one one day. Um, my dad is an old white retiree, and I love him very much. But that cannot be the um, only people who make decisions for a city. I remember in 2015, a friend of mine ran for council, and he didn't win, but he started a lot of good conversation. And I think that was the first moment that I realized somebody from my age group um, who's experiencing things like housing affordability and wanting to find transit and other ways to get around could maybe do something like this. And then in 2017, my counterpart, my at-large counterpart, Nicole Stewart won. And she um, is an environmentalist, young mom, um, married to a small business owner. And so when 2019 rolled around and I continued to see um, the city moving in a direction that I did not agree with, uh, despite Nicole's good work for two years on council by herself mostly, I decided it was time to raise my hand and to step forward. A lot of the issues that Raleigh's dealing with, we're experiencing explosive growth right now. Um, and so with that comes growing pains and challenges like housing affordability and infrastructure demands. And when I moved back to Raleigh, after law school, I worked for the state of North Carolina, which was a great job, but I didn't make that much money. And I had student loan debt and credit card debt. And I really struggled to find a place I could afford to live near my office. I wanted to live and work within walking distance. And at the friends were living in other places and they were renting garage apartments or basement apartments or duplexes. And there wasn't really anything like that available here. And I didn't know at the time, but it was because they weren't really allowed in our zoning code. And so since I've been elected, we've focused a lot on zoning reform, allowing missing middle housing, um, accessory dwelling units by right, increasing our transit amenities, shelters and benches and bike lanes, and trying to put goods and services closer to people so you don't have to have a car to get everything you need and trying to reduce vehicle miles traveled and greenhouse gases. So all of the things that I felt were important to build a resilient city, I was sitting on the sidelines hoping for them to happen. And I ultimately just decided it was time to, to step forward. Um, I like to say that I don't think anybody has solved the housing affordability or affordable housing crisis. I think if we if anybody had, we'd all just start copying it. Um, but I'm certain we're not going to solve it doing things the exact same way that got us into this mess. And so a lot of what I focused on since I've been on council is trying to do things new ways um, and being adaptable. Excellent. Uh, representative to tone. I uh, love saying that. Um, you know, I remember when you were stepping up. To, I remember what you were at the Long Beach training, I think, uh, of victory. And I remember talking uh, to you there um, and you had a plan. Uh, you had a great plan. Um, uh, but, you know, you're the first out trans person uh, elected legislature in, in Colorado. Um, there were a lot of people who did not have faith. Um, all from, you know, to, as Reen mentioned this, um, you know, it, you know, the idea of imposter syndrome 
um, is very real. Um, can you talk uh, a bit about that and uh, how you addressed it and you know how much you rubbed it in people's faces after you were elected? Well, thanks very much for the question, Sean. And yeah, I mean, it, there, there were a lot of reasons why people didn't think I was ever going to win. One was that I was a Democrat in a district that was drawn to be Republican. And it had been Republican by double digits ever since it was created. So as was strike one against me, then I was a trans person. So, you know, just having the courage to actually want to run was something that I had to mull over for a lot of different reasons. A trans person had never been elected before. Danica Rome was running, but when someone asked me to run, she hadn't won yet. So I had to wait for her to win to show that I could do that. That was impa very impactful for me to, to tip the scale for me. Uh, the other thing was, you know, my voice. As a trans person, I don't like the sound of my own voice. I, I don't want to hear that when I'm talking. And I knew that it was going to be a distraction to people. I knew that people were going to focus on that and wonder, why does this person look like a woman but sound different? And I started out my first speech with a joke saying that, you know, hi, I'm represent I, I'm, I wanna be represented in House District 27. Let me address the elephant in the room. I'm a trans person, now that that's out of the way, we'll address the elephant in the district. It got people to listen to what I had to say. And, and then we started, then I started talking about the issue. Um, it was really, really hard to raise money. It was really, really hard to, you know, get volunteers. People were like, don't, don't work with the tone. She's not going to win. There's no way. Spend, take your resources someplace else. So we had to work harder than everybody else. We focused all of our money on our team. We did all of our own lit. We didn't hire any consultants. We couldn't afford it. We did everything in house. We um, had volunteers writing postcards and we knocked on the doors and, and we knocked on the third highest number of doors in the state and we were not supported. That's how we got the message across the people. We knocked on doors that nobody had ever even been to before and they were really impressed by that. That is a huge thing. Uh, the other thing is, um, you know, the message and who I was, I, I brought a lot to the table and we made sure that people understood what that message was. And it's, it's something that you, you have to think about and you have to look at the numbers when you decide to run. And when I was looking at the numbers, the Republican won by 14%, but Hillary Clinton won in my district by 12 votes. Not twelve percent. That's all I needed to know was that there were enough people to vote for a Democrat in that district that I could get them to vote for me and I could win, even if it was as small as twelve or eleven or ten or even one. That's what we need to do. We can't be afraid of the naysayers and the people who say you can't and and it's not possible. Anything is possible if. The timing's right, the, 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 the stars align and you put the hard work in and you're the right candidate at the right time. So don't think that you can't make it, um, you know, evaluate it, talk about it. And then, you know, if you have the time, just jump in and do it because we need you. Excellent. And, and I, I will say this, you know, when it came to the misgivings that some people had, the proof was in the pudding for both you and for Danica. Their field plans were fantastic and they were executing them. The proof is in that pudding. Um, you do need to raise money to run for office, but knocking doors, having those conversations, that, that's really where you're going to make the most impact. Um, you know, uh, as Reen, we, we have you uh, still, I think, um, uh, you know, you mentioned was Duluth ready? You know, that is a uh, 88% white city, uh, only 10% of the population there are people of color. You know, as someone who is a, a young Asian woman, Muslim immigrant, an LGBTQ candidate, 
you know, bringing those new voices to political process, you know, how essential was that? And, and, and how was that a, a strength? Good question. Um, so uh, right off the bat, I noticed, um, and I'm sorry for folks who are seeing me in two different <laughs> screens, um, right off the bat, I noticed that a lot of the white campaigns that were on campus where, you know, the co local colleges and the high schools were in the community. Um, I was I was part of this movement, right? This movement of, you know, fighting for justice, raising our voices, getting folks involved, especially young folks involved. So when I decided to write uh, I we we may have lost your I'm going to be switching back and forth, I guess. Uh, when I decided to run for a political campaign in progress. <laughs> Um, for a political campaign, one thing I did. Um, thing I did was bring in all the people that I organized. Um, so whether it was bringing in folks when we were, when we were knocking on doors for. Uh, I'm so sorry. Uh, can folks still hear me? Um, hardly, I would say we're, we're not getting oh, uh, so too sorry. much of it. Okay. So essentially I brought in young folks who were, who I organized with before who had no, um, experience in political, um, campaigning, um, electoral campaigning and got them energized, got them part of the process. And I had a good mix of folks who have been politically uh, doing electoral or um, elect, uh, elected official campaignings and bringing in newer folks and bringing those people together, getting them energized. I think what was the was the kind of the moving force of our campaign. And frankly, it's in their hands. It's in the community that came together, build that solidarity. That's how I was able to um, essentially win the campaign. Um, and get, getting those young folks involved, re-engaging folks, uh, seniors, re-engaging middle class um, folks, um, and bringing people from all different aspects of life, bringing their diverse ideas, um, and running a campaign that was not a, like just very based on this is who we are, this is what our passions are, um, and this is what we want to see change in our environment, in our city. This is what we are fighting for, this is what we are advocating for, and people really resonated and connected with that. Um, and once we were able to have that mission, have that voice, um, and I think that's essentially how we were able to move past, you know, and that doesn't mean that I didn't face challenges. I had the police called on me twice while I was door knocking. Um, I had, I was spit at, I was, um, I was called many different names, you know, um, and all different aspects of my identity was attacked essentially, right? Whether that be my queer identity, my Muslim identity, my immigrant identity, even the fact that I am a non-traditional student and, you know, um, work multiple full-time or full-time and a part-time jobs to just afford rent um, and at the side be able to take courses. Even that was an issue for people, you know, people were like, she needs to like finish college. They need to do this first. They need to do this first. Um, but being able to bring those diverse can, uh, can, uh, voices together in a, like in my campaign, but then also elevating my voice and connecting with people at the doors, finding that common ground. Um, I think that was the winning movement, right? Um, building that solidarity together and knowing that we're not in this alone, even though the system tells us that we are in the, like we're alone, but we're not. Um, so it was building that coalition that helped me. Um, essentially win my campaign. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. Um, you know, Marie, tell us a little bit about, you know, you, 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 I think part of this, you know, what was, people are so amazed about when you ran was not only you ran a great campaign uh, and, and your firsts, um, but it is, it's in a deep red state in, in Oklahoma. Um, talk a little bit about bringing a progressive voice uh, to a legislature that is at, on on the march against so many of of your identities. Yeah, um, I think one thing that um, a lot of folks like on the outside of Oklahoma looking in might not realize is that 
House District 88 is also one of those um, pretty solidly democratic places, um, I think has been uh, held by a democratic representative for at least the last 30 years, if I remember correctly. And so our big, which a lot of folks don't like, but our big battle was going to be in the primary. I was running, I decided to run against a six year incumbent um, who at that point in time was the, was our champion for uh, 2S LGBTQ plus uh, issues as well as criminal justice, at that point in time, criminal justice reform. Um, but with that, um, especially when we're talking about our um, justice involved community and our 2S LGBTQ plus community, um, folks who had been on the receiving end right, of bad legislation or bad policy, uh, had been continuously saying like, this is actually how we do more inclusive work. Like let's work together. Like we are the directly impacted people and we are telling you, right? Because we've had to create these solutions in our everyday lives and he wasn't listening to us. And so that was the thing, right? Is that like allyship is wonderful but sometimes it only gets us so far and that we deserve to be our, our representation as well, right? Um, uh, and so that was one of the, one of the big things when it comes to when it came to like crossing that finish line for that primary in 2020, um, when it comes to the Oklahoma legislature now, right? That's one of the big things um, uh, that sometimes I have to think about, right? I wonder, right, with Oklahoma passing what the most restrictive abortion ban in U.S. history, right? Um, uh, passing legislation that says like folks who live beyond the binary don't get access to adequate gender um, uh, uh, gender affirming. ID and, and uh, things like this. Um, so sometimes I battle internally whether or not my community would be safer if I was still community organizing with the ACLU as opposed to being here, right? Because we talk about being the first in the few and I hope that you all do truly consider running but you think about it thoroughly because sometimes, right, visibility without, uh, a true community they're helping and pushing, right, is uh, sometimes puts a target on your back, right, makes you a target. And so wondering truly, for me, that target is my entire community and the work that we do together because I didn't get here on my own. I don't plan to do anything while I'm here on my own. And so under trying to figure out what that is, but also realizing that some of the, horrible things that the Oklahoma legislature does is, is some of the things, piece of legislation they write is about me. Some of it is absolutely not. Folks are just using policy in a place of bigotry and also understanding that there are so many people inside of House District 88, outside of House District 88, outside of Oklahoma, outside of the U.S. that reached out when this campaign, right, when this grassroots movement really flourished because People want to see themselves in politics in a way that they haven't before, right? People want to return to politics. Um, we want to be able to, to create the solutions for our everyday lives because the people closest to the problems are also closest to the solutions like we talked about a little bit earlier. Um, and so it's hard working in the Oklahoma legislature. It absolutely is. The first bill I ever wrote, uh, a committee chair sent it back to me and it just said, peel across it. Right, like we do, we have to go through so many different things, right? Especially when you start talking about intersecting identities. Um, but the work, my work is not limited and not bound to the four months a year that I am in the session um, uh, at the Oklahoma House of Representatives. It is bound in how we show up for our communities right now and every single day that we get to choose to do this work together. And so legislature's hard. But being in community and community organizing is the only thing I think I ever want to do in my life. So um, that's the easy part. Well, thank you for keeping up the fight um, in, in such a, a, a tough place. Um, truly, truly, uh, thank you. Um, uh, you know, I'd love to go to Jonathan. You know, Jonathan, right, hopefully we've talked to some folks who are watching and running. Uh, one of the things uh, that's going to be important um, is staffing, right? And people, a lot of people are going to run for local office. They're not going to be paying a campaign manager, right? Or, or necessarily staff. 
Tell us a little bit about putting together a coalition. You know, how'd you pick, you know, folks to help run your campaign, um, you know, volunteers. Tell us a little about a little bit about doing that. Well, the I would say first you need to lean on your existing network. So for me, I had done a lot of community organizing work and nonprofit work. And so I built sort of a network of folks organically through being in the community. I did have a paid full-time campaign manager. Um, and she was a former executive director of the County Democratic Party. And I did not know her before I decided to run, but someone who I knew through Stonewall Sports knew her and we sat down and I somehow convinced her to work with me. Uh, and she was brilliant. And I owe probably my success in that election to her. Her name is Virginia Reed. Um, but other than that, and, and I will say when she agreed to work with me, I did not have money to pay her. And I talked to someone else who my network connected me to, who is a political consultant, also a gay man. And he was kind enough to just sort of walk me through the steps. And what he told me was, is you have to believe in yourself and you're going to build the plane while you fly it. And so I just every month knew I had to pay Virginia and I had to raise money to get my name out. I was running against a seven term, 14 year incumbent, similar to what I heard here, though not for a lot of the same reasons, because um, I am a white man. I, um, and he was a white man. Uh, I am younger though. Uh, he, uh, uh, no one really wanted to work with me. Uh, they said, you don't, you won't win. He's always the top vote getter. Uh, I really like your message. I can't give you money because then he'll see it and he'll be upset with me. And so I had to work five times as hard. I got dejected sometimes because when I would be going in for endorsements on the local level, I felt like an outsider. And I felt like I was in this underbelly of a machine that was not built to cultivate new leadership but I just pushed through. Um, we did have a team of canvassers and door knockers and everybody putting out signs and all of that was just through uh, my kickball teams and the nonprofits I work for. And with, um, I initially raised a good bit of my money through the legal profession because I'm a lawyer. And so, um, you know, I called them and said, I need help. Uh, but it started to catch on. And, and by the end of the election, I had gotten the endorsement of the two major news publications in Raleigh. And I had raised a good bit of money. I had to work probably five times as hard as it would have been for an incumbent to raise the money. Um, organizations like Run for Something and Victory Fund were invaluable, um, having those mentors to be able to bounce ideas off of um, and to, to help with elevating the message. Um, I think when you're a first time candidate, the big challenge, at least for me, was uh, name recognition. You don't you have to really work for it. You either have to buy it or work for it. You don't get to earn it because you're not sitting in the seat um, making the decisions yet. And so you just have to grow your network organically, I think, and then lean on that network to help connect you. Because you may not know someone who knows how to run a campaign, but you probably do know someone who knows someone who knows how to run a campaign. So just don't be afraid to ask for help. Amazing and exactly correct. Um, start making that list now of the people you're going to be asking and talking to. It will help you down the line. I think we can all tell you that. Um, real quickly, uh, you know, everyone's mentioned it in passing. Um, you know, fundraising, it is necessary, right? You're not going to be able to knock every door. Even if you did, not everyone's going to be home. You're going to need to reach out to them through the mail, through digital, through radio, TV, however else you might be able to. Um, so, um, Azreen, uh, you know, you're, you were a student, you are a student, um, right? You said you're working a couple of jobs, you stepped up to run, um, you know, but you helped you, I think you set a fundraising record for Duluth. So could you tell us all how you did that? Because I think that could be really helpful to some folks looking to step forward. Yeah. Um, so in my campaign team, I had a, a very diverse campaign team. I had folks who were seniors. I had folks who were young folks, high school students. I had um, so a, and a lot of diversity um, identities represented in on my campaign team, essentially. Um, and one thing I wanted to stress is that we wanted to create this environment where people's voices were being heard and people's ideas were being like you know taken uh, taken seriously. Um, so we would be throwing out different ideas, brain, having different brainstorming sessions on how we can raise money. And that was actually one of the biggest challenge I, 
door knocking was great. Yes, there were those times when that was very difficult um, being out there at the doors, but it was a great, uh, like phone calls, door knocks, they were all great. Um, one thing though, my campaign team um, brought to, brought was that um, we, uh, we brainstormed a lot of different ideas. We thought of the normal, how do people uh, fundraise, right? So how we thought of billboards, radio ads, um, or no, sorry, we were like doing normal, like reach outs, phone calls to uh, community members. But then we were also pushing grass, grassroots campaigning. Um, we were asking folks to donate, can you donate $5? Can you donate $10? We were creating different social media campaigns for fundraising, like a bingo board and being able to have your, um, your picture on the bingo card in that fundraising goal. So a lot of our fundraising goals um, fundraisers um, came out of like diverse ideas, came out of like thinking outside of the box in different ways on how can we fundraise. And then just being very authentic to ourselves and being very transparent. Hey, we're fundraising this amount for this billboard or we're fundraising this much for this radio ad that will get my, get my message out to more voters. So we were trying to bring diverse ideas to the table, but then also thinking, how can we be transparent to the people who are donating and be real with them too? It's like, this is why we need a fundraise in order to be successful in this campaign. Um, and, you know, we use that money, we use that fundraising to be able to reach more people, more voters, um, be able to like even, you know, bring together our campaign team uh, for different events. Um, and just be able to uh, reach the people that aren't normally reached through that, right? And we we used all different platforms like Facebook, Inst social media, radio, billboards. So I guess think about, think outside of the box, what are normal strategies that are utilized in your community, in your team? Think what else can you bring in, bring in diverse ideas, and then be transparent, be honest, be authentic on what that funding is going to um, be real. Because like, you know, as someone, you know, who, you know, struggles to pay rent, you know, and having multiple jobs, I understand how far that dollar can go. So when I'm asking people for that dollar, I was like, I understand I'm asking you for this dollar. This is how I'm going to utilize that do a dollar to raise my voice, elevate your voice and help our community. And I think that message and that authenticity really connected with people. Um, so our average, even though we raised so much money, our average donor was about 15 to $27 between that range. Um, so around $20. Um, uh, and so utilizing those grassroots, boots on the ground, bringing in community, bringing in those connections um, that was talked about and just you know make sure that your community has a voice and find ways to um, elevate that voice. And that's how we're all in fundraising. Amazing, absolutely amazing. Thank you so much all for answering those questions. I'm gonna pass it back to Quentin to uh, move us to the next part of this endeavor. Listen, I want another hour. This was so great. We, we're living in such bleak times. It's really hard to, to find things to be hopeful in. And this was such a hopeful conversation and I really appreciate being a part of it. Uh, thank you all very much. I want to open the poll, but I want to first talk to some of the folks. If you're interested in learning more or talking more about your plans to run for office and brainstorming next steps, please opt in for a call with Run for Something with a Run for Something volunteer. Since our inception in 2017, we have endorsed over, or we have identified, I should say, over 110,000 candidates that want to run for office, endorsed more than 2,000, and of them, 136 LGBTQIA plus folks have been elected to office. Our voices are necessary. We need our voices making policy. So please sign up to get a call from a volunteer of ours that can talk to you about next steps in running for office. I'm going to launch a poll that will ask you just that. Are you interested in learning more about running for office? And while you're filling out said poll, please do not forget to drop questions in the Q&A box. And we are gonna get to some of those questions. I'm really excited to, to address some of them. I did wanna answer one question that came up about staffing and resources. Some of the resources that we provide at Run For Something are, we are able to leverage our partnerships. And one of our great partners is the National Democratic Training, Training Committee, NDTC. 
We also have a partnership with Arena and Victory Fund, and they all provide campaign staff training. So keep those feathers in your cap when you decide to run for office, because those are resources that can be very helpful in answering that staffing question, because yes, it can absolutely be very hard. And it looks like we've got a couple more folks that are going to be answering here shortly. I'll leave it open for another minute or so, and uh, we can start posing some of these questions to our panelists. Uh, community organizing, this is from Sam, Samuel M. Community organizing seems to be a passion for many of you. Have you been able to keep contact with local grassroots organizations while in office? How has your relationship with community groups changed since becoming elected? Uh, and I would like to start with Representative Turner, if that's okay. For sure. Um, I, I absolutely do stay connected with um, uh, my, I think, kind of community organizing leads because like they are also my friends. Um, uh, and, and so it, it makes it a lot easier uh, because we all get to continuously do the work together because the like that was the thing. It, it was like a it wasn't just me deciding to run for office. It was a community collective effort of like we should do this and we built the playbook and we're now going to see it through. And so staying together to figure out how we um, uh, fill the gaps that our government leaves for us when they write really, pardon my French, like shitty policy. Um, uh, so um, it is, it, it is, it's been wonderful to be able to stay in touch with everybody that I was community organizing with before becoming elected and also seeing how that grew once I became elected. Like I'm so I'm wearing this baseball jersey right now. Um, uh, I got the doors, uh, was knocking doors and then came and did this. And the last door I knocked, um, uh, the kid said like, I saw you on a, um, on a panel about safe needle exchange. Like, are you just like everywhere? And I'm like, that's kind of my job is to try to be like, to, to know like what's going on in the district to figure out like where are other gaps that we could be possibly connecting folks to resources and if there aren't any resources creating those and so community organizing I, I me personally I think the best politicians are community organizers um so uh yeah fantastic can I go to representative to tone next sure um uh, what what I really did with uh organizing in the beginning was um we were working on these LGBT bills, and I was working with uh, our big organization in Colorado called One Colorado. We were lobbying legislators and trying to get conversion therapy banned uh, said, and we were trying to um, change the, the way that trans people can get their, their name changed on their birth certificate. Um, those bills kept failing over and over and over again because the Republicans controlled the Senate. So, you know, I said, well, what, what if we do something a little bit different? What if we go at it a little bit differently? And what if we go to the city level and pass ordinances or proclamations or whatever they can do to strengthen our position and, and really stack the deck? So that's kind of how I ended up uh, starting in, in community organizing. And since I've been in office, I work with One Colorado still on these, uh, these issues. I work with uh, Planned Parenthood in Cobalt. I, I'm at a Cobalt event. Cobalt is uh, like NARAL. Uh, they changed their name here in Colorado. Um, we work very closely with all of these different uh, organizing groups because you know they know that I'm a grassroots candidate. I started out literally knowing nobody, and through you know talking to people, getting and earning the trust of grassroots organizing groups like one in my city that popped up after 2016. Um, they, were in, they were very influential in, in helping me get elected. If it weren't for them, I wouldn't have had those volunteers because I was such a lost cause and nobody wanted to help me. Um, but I still, um, I show up to their meetings and picnics and events and all of those things to make sure that they know that I'm still uh, a grassroots person, and that I'm still there uh, working with them on the side, and I still I show up on the picket lines, I show up at the rallies, I show up all the time, and showing up is the number one thing you can do if you want to run for office and you want people to see that you're serious about running and winning that seat. You own it, 
and you show up every single time. That is powerful because that's how you make those connections. That's how you impress people. And they, they see you not as nobody anymore. They see you as, oh, you're here again. Oh, you're here again. <laughs> and then you, they see you all the time and they have to accept you to be there because you're putting in that work. So that's um, some of the advice I would say about you know grassroots organizing and um, it's a great way to meet people and expand out in, into uh, places and, and win, win people over, especially when you're uh, someone who, who's not very well known in, in the area. Thank you very much. That's an incredible answer. I have a, a different question for Council Person uh, Azreen. How would you balance, how did you balance running a campaign and working a full-time job? And I believe you also said multiple jobs in some cases. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Running a campaign and being elected official. Um, there's certain um, mm -hmm. I had to switch my full time job um, because it was shift work. I was working at a youth homeless shelter. Um, I had very, um, like, uh, rich, uh, scabbing, um, and I needed something more flexible. So I did move into a different nonprofit, still doing community youth engagement and youth advocacy work, um, but it was a little more engaging, um, flexible in the way where I could kind of choose, oh no, I swear it's the heat. It's the heat that's making all my technology malfunction right now. Um, essentially, um, it, it's a, it, um, so I had to try to figure out how to balance um, still paying rent and paying tuition and having a roof over my head, getting, um, and my campaign. So one thing I did was I had a job transition where I moved into working um, into something a little more flexible and I was really upfront with them. It's like, I'm running a campaign. This is, I need support in this way, right? If you, you know, this is how I can support you. This is how I can support the community, but this is the support I need. So, and my place of work at the time was very flexible with me. We're willing to work with my schedule. So I was still working 40 hours and another part-time job, which um, was also flexible with me, um, where I was able to still run that campaign. But I also recognize my privilege, right? Like I'm not a single mom. Um, I mean, I do have pets, animals. Um, and I had to really lean on my community members. I don't have a vehicle. So I was using public transportation, which it gets really tricky when you're trying to door knock in all parts of the city, right? Um, so a lot of my campaign members would show up. Um, they would be bringing me um, uh, to places. We were organizing different rides, not just for me, but for the rest of my campaign team. We were organizing who, who needs to be fed, right? Who needs water? Who needs food? We were mobilizing in that way. Um, and so like we, I had to really, really lean on my campaign team. And before I even started actively campaigning, I had to have that frank, honest discussion with my campaign team. It's like, these are my identities. This is how I've gotten uh, pushed back and op faced oppression from every single one of those identities that I, um, that I hold. And this is how you can show up. And then this is the realities of being um, working class, and this is the support I need. I need help with transportation. I also need help with this and this. If I have to like step back from some of my part-time work, this is where I need the rest of the community and my campaign team to push, um, come in. So I really leaned on my campaign team. They were amazing to work with. They were amazing to just really supportive and leaned on my community. And we were able to just move for, forward together. That being said, I again, recognize my privilege. And if, um, that I didn't, um, you know, I, I'm a single person in my household. I, I'm not, I'm not a caretaker of someone else. Um, I'm not a single mom. So if we have folks of diverse identities um, who have those needs, those needs need to be addressed by your campaign team. Um, you need to mobilize, you need to figure out how to create mutual aid around you and around your community to be able to succeed. Um, and I, I that's 
the only way I was able to get through it. I was able to still pay rent. I was able to still be active at, um, on my team is um, or in the campaign. I really leaned on my team. I really leaned on my community and I knew my community was also leaning on me and counting on me to get the work that um, I needed to get done. So it was trying to find that balance. And that balance is still tricky. It's still tricky even after now as elected official, right? Um, it's still tricky to be an active community member, be an elected official, and it's trying to find that balance um, consistently and do what's healing for you and your community. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you for that answer. Uh, Councilman Melton, I want to ask, there's a couple questions that have come through about when, when you're running for office, how is it that candidates are able to make up for the lack of maybe legal infrastructure to make sure that they're staying afloat and in compliance with state and local laws around fundraising, around accepting gifts or permits, or just making sure you don't end up in an orange jumpsuit? Because we know that... <laughs> You know, you run, you make one mistake when you are a person of color or come from marginalized communities and they send the entire justice system after you, but you can literally plan a coup and not have any repercussions. So what recommendations or resources did you use? Uh, and maybe you're a lawyer, so that probably, that you probably have that knowledge just innately, but what resources did you use or would suggest to first time candidates to make sure that they stay on top? of those type of requirements and uh, compliance related issues? So I'm a divorce and family law attorney, so I had no idea what I was doing. Okay. With the <laughs> yeah. um, in North Carolina and in Wake County where Raleigh is located, the county board of elections, were, um, once you declare your candidacy, they had a mandatory training. So there was a legal training and a financial training um, so that was very helpful, but then also just calling the county board of elections or the state board of elections. They're actually very helpful or go by there and ask questions. I actually messed up when I opened my campaign finance account. I did it the wrong way and they walked me. I was freaking out. I thought I was going to be disqualified or something or that it would be like a news story that I didn't do it right. But it turns out a lot of candidates make mistakes. And I think there's a difference between I didn't fill out the right paperwork or I'm doing something gravely illegal. And, and, and if you make a, a small, honest mistake, you just have to fix it. It's all about transparency. Um, and so, you know, I would call the county board of elections and say, what am I supposed to do about this? Can I do this? When is this due? And so I think that that's the best way to go about it. You can't have too many, much pride and say, think I don't want to ask for help. Um, so I would check out and see if your, your local board of elections or your state board of elections um, requires training or offers training resources. Um, and then also just go by there and talk to folks and ask for help if you need it. Fantastic. I want to do one last round robin question and I'm, I'm stealing Sean's idea. I hope he doesn't mind. But if you could go back in time as a first time candidate, what advice would you give yourself as a first time candidate prior to running your race? Two words, a sentence even. And we can start with Representative Turner. Um, that's a good one, uh, a lot of advice. Um, uh, I think personally, if, what I would talk to myself about before deciding to run for office, um, like if I knew now and could go back, um, is to like, there are going to be some things, not everything, but there are gonna be some things that you can't take personal. I take a lot of things personal. Like you say, you're gonna volunteer, you don't. I'm like, what's going on here? Um, uh, so I think that's it, right? Especially in the time of COVID and the time that we are in the nation, right? Like everybody's got so many things going on. And so I truly do have to have a conversation with myself of like, I shouldn't be taking this personally. It's fine. It doesn't matter if they've got like more folks out on the doors or anything like that. Like, um, uh, because right, like so much like we all, like every candidate is going to need help, right? And we are all trying to work together to create something beautiful um, uh, and something sustainable. And so um, I think just in some instances, it's okay to not take it personal. Um, uh, I would, that's probably the best thing I can think of right now. Awesome. How about you, Representative Tatone? 
Well, you know, she, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Maury uh, took my answer um, because I was going to say that too. Um, you know, when I ran, nobody helped me and I, and I took it personally that they were just, they just didn't want to help me. And I was like, why, 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 why won't you help me? And um, it's not because they, they don't want to, they're playing the numbers. It's a numbers game. Politics is all about probability. And if you're not in that probability range of winning, you're not going to get that help, but don't give up and don't look at that as a negative. Just keep pushing on and let them say you're not going to win and you just show them wrong and you, and you win and, and don't give up. I love it. I love it. How about you, council member, uh, Azarina Wall? Believe in yourself because regardless, um, be, believe in yourself, push through the imposter syndrome. People are going to be um, pushing you down, doubting you and doubting your community. But if you continue to be authentic, believe in yourself and build collaboration and community support, you will go far. Um, and I hope every single one of you runs for office because we need your voice. Yes, we do. Saving democracy will take all of us. Um, how about you, council member, Melton? Those are all really good responses and I probably share all of them. I think one thing for me is listen to yourself. And I mean that in two ways is um, your name is what's gonna, gonna be, be on the ballot. And so you will have people telling you to say or do certain things and you have to win or lose. I felt very proud of the campaign that I ran um, and, and the quality of the campaign. And I, I never attacked anybody, um, even when I was told to. And so that's important. And then also listen to yourself and allow your messaging to change. And I don't mean change your principles. What I was talking about stayed the same. How I talked about issues, I learned throughout the campaign. And the way I would convey a message at the end of the election cycle, I would look back to how I was doing at the beginning of the election cycle. And I felt like a totally different person. I just, I felt like I learned how to explain my values and my platform in a much more clear and concise way. And that will take time. It'll take practice at forums. It'll take practice knocking doors. And you just have to um, be willing to like listen to yourself and adapt as you go. And by the end of the election cycle, I guarantee you, you're gonna feel like a pro. You'll have your sea legs. And if you do it the, your way, you'll feel very proud, win or lose. That is awesome. And last but not least, I would like Sean to answer. Sean ran for Congress this year. What, what advice would you give yourself? What two words? Uh, in addition to run, um, uh, like run away. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, you know, the only resource you can get more of is time. Um, and so uh, make the plan now, get trained now, so that when that opportunity presents itself, you're ready to pounce because you might be doing it in a shortened timeline and you wanna be ready to go. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, listen, thank you all so much. Before we go, I just wanna express my deepest gratitude to our panelists tonight. Thank you for sharing your lived experiences, your wisdom. I am deeply appreciative. Our community is deeply appreciative. We also wanna thank everyone who participated in watching this, this stream and ask questions. Everyone on this call will be getting an email from us tomorrow morning with resources from Run For Something to use as you prepare to run for office. And if you opted to speak with a volunteer based on our poll, look for an email for them, from them in the next few weeks to find a time to schedule uh, a call to chat with you about your, your plans to run for office. We need you, we're here to support you. I've had a fantastic time. You all are such delightful panelists and elected officials. I am so hopeful and I really appreciate it. Have a great night and thank you so much for joining us.